Good morning, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project Magnetic Reversal News and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a grand solar minimum update Sunday, November 28th, around 11 a.m. Mountain Time 2021. We predicted a blot echo, a warning zone in Peru, and it, well, 24 hours later, 7.5 magnitude happening just six miles south of Quito, Ecuador, in the region that we warned about. But the big story, Canada issues Weather red alert for British Columbia, never before in history. This is coming after mudslides and devastating flooding hit the region just a week ago. Keep calm. It's boom time. Environment Canada has issued its first red alert for British Columbia ahead of what officials are characterizing as dangerous weather system expected to push more atmospheric rivers into the province. The red level is something new that we have not issued. Armel Castellan, a meteorologist with Environment and Climate Change Canada, told CNN Canada affiliate CTV. Now, earlier this month, British Columbia, Canada's westernmost province, experienced a catastrophic flooding event, forcing evacuations, damaging highways and infrastructure along the Fraser River Valley down to the U.S. border and disrupting shipping in Vancouver. And it appears as if it's going to be even worse. Here's some pictures from... The last event, flooding on the Fraser River there. As hundreds were rescued from British Columbia roadways. And it doesn't, it appears as if this will be even worse. Um, if we just move it through the next few days here, let's just take it out right here. This is through December 3rd. This is the next five days. And there are some regions that could pick up 14 to 16 inches of rain. In that same area, we're looking at 9 to 12 inches of rain. And so it doesn't look as if this is going to be any better. And look at that. Another system here mid-December is coming to saturate that region again. So boom after boom is going to be crushing British Columbia day by day. So it slowly gets wet through December 1st, then the big rains first through December 2nd happen. And that's where the flooding will happen up in this region. Maybe there'll be some new flooded areas, but also in that saturated region, it is looking to be hit twice in the next two weeks. So heads up to the people up in those regions for another event, more catastrophic flooding, more mudslides. Pancake ice forms atop Lake Superior in Wisconsin. Now all month, I've heard how warm the Great Lakes are and it's historic global warming, blah, blah, blah. But rare ice pancakes were spotted floating atop Lake Superior near Ashland, Wisconsin. The footage was posted November 26, and it shows the phenomenon occurs when extremely cold air temperatures cause disks of ice to grow on the water surface. So, absolutely burning up there in Wisconsin. Rain. Heavy rain and strong winds across the northwest will continue for weeks. Snow across the Great Lakes and northeast. The Pacific Northwest remains active with more rain and potential flooding. Strong winds will extend inland across the state of Montana and the northern Rockies, across the Great Lakes and the northeast. A clipper-type system, we used to call them the Alberta Clipper, will bring more snow to the region with heavy lake-effect snow downwind of the Great Lakes. Gusty winds will produce elevated fire threats in Southern California. And now we'll take a look at the GFS snowfall model, just to bring you up to speed with what the models are saying. There's going to be a system moving into the northeast right now, Monday, Tuesday, and you can see heaviest snow there by Cleveland and Erie, those regions. Upstate New York, second system, another Alberta clipper. And this is also simultaneously being high elevation snow to the northwest. Here's Wednesday, December 2nd, a third system. And a fourth system on December 4th moves into upstate New York. Look at that. System after system in the Northeast like a beast. And by the end of the first week of December, we could have a southern storm setting up to pummel southern Appalachia. Take a look at some of those totals. This is very early, and this is about 10 days out, so we wouldn't rely on this so much. But even Texas, the nexus of the Schmexus, is going to be picking up what we're putting down. France has suffered a wine disaster. But there could be a silver lining. And if you read the article, it's hilarious. Early frost, destroying crops, destroying 80% in some regions in the Burgundy region. 
and they say the good news is that next year will probably be better. Little do they know. <laughs> now back to Peru and the 7.5 magnitude earthquake. Thankfully, striking in the middle of nowhere. Now, actually, some people live in this region. Obviously, there's a city here a few miles away, several, but very remote area, very few people. Quito is far enough away to have been spared much of the destruction. And Peru's president pledges support for those affected by the 7.5 magnitude earthquake, which happened in the Reserva Nacional Pacaya, Samaria. That sounds impressive. It's right near the state of Amazonas in the state of Acre or Acre. I would say that. Seismic update. There is the 7.5 boomer. 42 kilometers north-northwest of Barranca, Peru. There is no tsunami warning because it was on land, well inland. No other quakes of note, thankfully. La Palma eruption update. New vents open at the northeastern side of the cone. This happened just about 12 hours ago, generating lava fountains and new lava flows. The analysis is uh, pretty simple, that the magma cannot reach the top of the cinder cone anymore. Therefore, it has broken out on the flanks, which are signs of this volcano and the magma coming to a close here. You can see a view of those lava fountains down low on the cinder cone now. Now, several new vents open up this morning at the northern and northeastern base of the main cone, producing lava fountains and emitting new lava flows. And this comes as a result of a new surge of magma that was announced itself in the last 24 hours with slight inflation observed during yesterday. Okay, we lost it. Now, they're claiming that the magma chose to create new vents nearby. Likely, the older conduits at the cone have become too high and too difficult to reach compared to creating new fissures at the base of the cone, and that's probably what's happening here. And there's one thing we want to look at. First, let's look at the earthquakes today. In the last 24 hours, the largest quake is 3.5. There have been about 100 quakes overall, and that has to do with the magma surge. So you can see here about 12 hours ago, that little surge in seismicity, that magma has come out. And that event is probably ending. We can come over here to the Volcano Live and take a look at what's going on as the sun sets. There's lots of soot and ash coming out of the top of the cinder cone, but there's no lava fountaining or visible lava in the dark here. So as we've been predicting, this is uh, around day 70. The next longest eruption known is 85 days. So that's the furthest we'll take this out, two more weeks, but it could be ending anytime soon, except for the seismicity data here. And you can see there's been a, an uptick in just the last few hours in seismicity corresponding with that seismic activity. But the seismic activity has fallen off. That'll be reflected in the morning in the graphs. And this looks like it's leveled off and will probably drop down to baseline. So quick update on the Palma. Now let's talk about space weather. Here we're looking at Discover Solar Wind. And let's just turn this off. Discover Solar Wind. And our last update, we were talking here about the coronal hole coupling, and we're waiting for that CME in the form of a filament, which hit here, where you can see all the vertical lines matching up. That's a CME impact. And this is in the form of that plasma filament that took off the sun about two or three days ago. We said it might get to KP4, which is geomagnetic instability, and it never reached there. We It is at KP3. So that space weather event only got to KP3, not even geomagnetic instability. And that has a lot to do with um, the state of the plasma speed at the time of the impact, which was very low here, down at 300 kilometers per second. Even though it jumped almost 200 kilometers, it was down at three, so it barely got up above, well, it only jumped 120 kilometers per second, so it barely got to 500. We would be seeing geomagnetic instability up in the 500 range and never even got close there. So all is quiet on the Western Front. Should drop off the KP0, and we should be psychic in a few hours. Now, many people have been asking me what we know. It's been a year about cycle 25 versus cycle 24. You can just simply come over to the real-time data and look at the sunspot numbers at the international sunspot graph here. The last 13 years in forecasts, We'll leave you a link to this below. This is from the Royal Observatory of Belgium. And here's the beginning of cycle 24, all of cycle 24, that double peak, second peak being higher, which is indicative of the beginning of a grand minima. And we've been waiting for that signal and the channel began right after that. 
And we've dropped down in cycle 24 and cycle 25 began in at the end of 2020, uh, 2019 here, December. And so what we see is one year of data for 25 and we also can compare it to one year of data of cycle 24. So if we go one, two, three, one year of data for cycle 24, and we come up here on the graph to the red and blue line, you can see where they're, they're meeting at 50, 50 sunspots. And if we do the same here, and we average these two, it's a little less than that. We're looking at about 45, maybe 40 sunspots at the same time. So they appear to be pretty similar in uh, scale and scope right now, but we really won't know until we have another year of data. So there's the, your quick comparison. Cycle 24 and cycle 25 appear to be almost the same at this point. Now, what secrets can the world's first magma observatory discover one mile inside a volcano? Well, they've talked about drilling wells into Yellowstone and other large calderas. They have some geothermal plants near Long Valley, but this is Iceland. And a, a lot of the geothermal activity and, and heat in Iceland is used through geothermal activity, but this is different. They're going to actually drill directly what they claim into a magma chamber. Kind of interesting. We'll wonder how they're going to be doing that. And they're going to be drilling into um, a volcano up in the northeast here called Krafla. And it's called the Krafla Magma Testbed. Now, the team hopes to drill into the volcano's magma chamber. Unlike the lava spewed above the ground, the molten rock beneath the surface remains a mystery. And why it wouldn't squirt out of the hole they drilled is anyone's guess. So, quick look over here. Here is Krafla up here where that experiment is going to happen sometime next year. And we're currently waiting for Ostia, Grimsvolten. Badabunga, Hekla, or Reykjanes to start erupting anytime soon. So here we are at Iceland, and we can see general seismicity across that fissure is, is pretty high. So we're just waiting for maybe Bardabunga to Joculups and then erupt. Grimsvotten, Ashja, Hekla, or Reykjanes to start erupting again. Just a matter of time, folks. Now, weird tracks in the tech in Texas indicate giant sauropods were walking on their front feet only. This is not a mystery. Just look at the shape of the animal. And if you're in a lake and you're walking in deep enough water, you're going to float. Your tail will float. And your back legs will come up. And so your only mode of movement is your front legs. And so it's not really a weird track. It's exactly what you would expect to happen when a large animal starts floating and their back legs come up and they can only go forward using their front legs. Doggy paddle much? Deep equatorial Pacific Ocean oxygenation and atmospheric CO2 over the last ice age. This paper from Scientific Reports, well, it proves a bunch of things. That atmospheric CO2 increase is associated with temperature fluctuations. And the CO2 has been following the proxy data since proxy data has been collected. CO2 does not force temperature. Temperature forces CO2. And you can see that in the final graph because CO2 lags behind every single indicator. Which means that CO2 doesn't do anything. It responds to everything. Astronomers discover giant wave-shaped structure in the Milky Way. Oh, my. As if no one else has discovered this before. Now, many of you watch channels that talk about the galactic superwave. But do they give credit where credit is due? I doubt it. No scientist does. Here's a new paper coming out yesterday calling it the Gangotri wave. Connecting two of the Milky Way spiral arms. Just discovered. Wow. And over the last year, wave after wave has been discovered. The only problem is this galactic cosmic wave was discovered by Paul Lavoillette. Now, we had Paul on the show about a year ago, and we're going to get him back on the show to discuss why everyone is stealing his work. Now, if you want the most comprehensive book on Ice Age 
catastrophe, the cosmic catastrophe cycle. It is none other than Paul Lavolette's Earth Under Fire, Humanity's Survival of the Ice Ages. One of the most comprehensive scientific endeavors where people like Doug Vogt and others have stolen his work and claimed it for their own. If you want the real source of information, it's Paul Lavolette. We'll leave you links to his book, and we'll leave you links to his first paper on the topic back in 1986. Mind blown. Now, Fauci, ouchie, we're going to have to start living with COVID. Well, this is the most unscientific nonsense I've heard since the beginning of the nonsense. It's clear that we know that this coronavirus is zoonotic. They find it all over in populations of deer. And it's not going anywhere because it's a coronavirus and it's zoonotic. And everyone knows it, including, well, the big guy who was spotted in Nantucket shopping indoors without a mask. Right in front of a sign requiring a mask. What an ass. It's not too late to save on Black Friday. Hemp Lucid sale is continuing for another week. It's two for one today. Two for one. That is two for the price of one. That's a boom. Holy macaroni. Did he say two for one? Yes, he did. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people. Thanks to all our one-time donors, our Patreons. You're all heroes. And those people who share this video. We love you. And that's a boom to knowledge. Be safe. Mm -hmm.